Okay, welcome everybody. So after three lectures of putting up with my handwriting and talking about how to estimate dark matter indirect detection signals and what you might actually see in telescopes and the different kind of signals you might look for, today I'm finally going to show you some real constraints and some anomalies that have been interpreted as possible signals of dark matter annihilation or decay. Uh, I'm going to, time permitting, I'm also going to try to focus in on a bit more detail on two of these, in particular one constraint anom and one anomaly, the constraint from the cosmic microwave background and the anomaly that's known as the GEV galactic center excess. The reason I'm focusing on these two is partly just personal interest, I've worked extensively on these, but also because the tools that you need to take these constraints and apply them or to take the CMB constraints and apply them to your favorite dark matter model of choice, or to take the GEV excess and do your own analysis on it and try to figure out what's going on, are all almost entirely public. So I'm going to point you to the URLs that you need for that, and I do encourage you, if you're interested, to go play with the code, the results. But before we get to those, I want to begin by just going through an overview of where we currently stand with the constraints that we've been talking about broadly for the last couple of lectures. Okay, so first let me talk about limits from gamma rays. So there are basically three classes of telescopes in the gamma ray energy range above a GV. So these telescopes are excellent for searching for WIMP scale dark matter in that GV up to 100 TV range. At the low end of this energy range, we have the space-based telescopes. So these are out there in space. They um, measure gamma rays impinging directly on the detector. They're basically a particle detector. A gamma ray comes in, it produces a shower of particles. You look for the shower of particles and use it to reconstruct where the gamma ray came from. Um, the, dis the disadvantage of these experiments is that because they're in space, they have to be kind of small. Fermi has an effective area of... Um, around a square meter, sometimes a little bit less, depending on energy. The latest telescope in this category is DAMPI, which is a Chinese mission which just presented their first results very recently in the last couple of months. Uh, they've been doing calibrations and testing for the last year or so, and, um, but that will be something to watch. So most of the results I'll be showing you will be from Fermi, but DAMPI will be something to watch in coming years. Once you go up to higher energy, you have more options because sufficiently high energy cosmic rays, when the, uh, gamma rays, when they hit our atmosphere, they produce a shower of Cherenkov light. So the atmosphere may screen out the original gamma ray, but you can look for the Cherenkov shower. So that's what these higher energy gamma ray experiments do. There are essentially two main technologies here, the Air Cherenkov telescopes. There's a picture of HESS, but there's also Veritas and MAGIC, very similar. And they can probe gamma rays from about the 100 GeV scale up to the tens of TeV scale. At higher energies still, you have the Water Cherenkov telescope technology, which is currently represented by the Hawk telescope. This is, this is a picture of it. Hawk is fairly recent. Only over the last year or two have they started producing a lot of results. So that's also something to watch. Both of these are looking for the Cherenkov light. It's just a question of... Um, whether you look for the air Cherenkov shower or whether you, um, you, you have a lot of water tanks. The showers there. Okay, so what can we do with this array of telescopes to search for d dark matter? Well, as we talked over the last few days, one of the lead candidates that people like is to look at the dwarf galaxies of the Milky Way because they're relatively close, order tens of kiloparsecs away rather than tens of megaparsecs, like clusters. And because they're objects with very little baryonic matter in them, the backgrounds are expected to be pretty small. So what you do for these dwarfs is, as we discussed earlier, you estimate the dwarf J factors from stellar kinematics. You do, the, for your preferred dark matter model of choice, which is usually parametrized by a standard model two-body final state, as we discussed, you, um, you take the J factor and your spectrum, predict the spectrum a magnitude that you would see, then... You look at the actual data, you know where the position of the dwarf is, so you fit the spectrum that you're looking for as a bump on top of some estimate of the smooth diffuse background. So the diffuse background in gamma rays primarily comes from charged cosmic rays interacting with the gas and starlight of the Milky Way. As we discussed last time, the spectra of those cosmic rays are roughly broken power laws, so the spectra of the diffuse background also tends to be fairly power law-like. I'll show you this explicitly later. So you, uh, you're essentially doing a hunt for the 
broad continuum spectrum from dark matter annihilation or decay in this case. Then you stack all your dwarfs together. You just combine the likelihoods for the various dwarfs, assuming that the errors from one dwarf to another are uncorrelated. And Fermi, the Fermi collaboration presented limits based on 45 dwarf galaxies and candidate dwarf galaxies earlier this year. And these, to my knowledge, are the strongest robust bounds on sub-TV dark matter annihilating of photon-rich channels. The likelihoods, the results of this analysis, uh, in terms of likelihood functions for each individual dwarf in each energy band are all available at this website. That means that if you have a dark matter model that has some funny combination, that has some specific combination of final states or has some final state that they didn't consider, like annihilation or decay into a mediator of dark photon, which subsequently decays back to the standard model, then you can just go download these constraints and set limits on whatever spectra you're interested in. My collaborators and I did this for um, most of the four body final states, the dark photon based channels, a couple of years ago. So I'm going to show you examples for annihilation into B quarks and tau leptons. So these are the photon rich continuum final states that I told you about earlier. And I'll show you line channels and search for leptonic channels a bit later. So this is, so at, at higher, at higher energies, you can also set constraints from looking at dwarfs with Veritas, Magic, or Hess. Um, telescopes that I mentioned in the next feature. So this is a combined analysis from last year of the dwarf galaxies with Fermi at low energies and Magic at high energies. So the dashed line here is showing the Fermi constraint. The, thin, the narrow dashed line is showing the Magic constraint from one of these Echerenkov telescopes. And then the solid line is showing the combined limit. So you can see below about a, t below about a TeV and dark matter mass for these channels, Fermi really dominates that constraint. It's hard to compete with Fermi at those low energy scales. But then once you get up into the range where the uh, Echerenkov telescopes can take over, the advantage of the Echerenkov telescopes at high energy is because they're Earth-based, you can build them with effective areas of 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5 square meters instead of 1 square meter like Fermi. Whereas you're never going to put, be able to put a 100 square meter gamma ray telescope up into space. But you can't see the low energy events then. This red dash line is the thermorelic cross section. So you see that these limits are basically constraining thermorelic dark matter annihilating the B quarks or tau leptons below a mass scale of about 100, uh, below a mass scale of about 100 GeV. So these are results for other channels annihilation and double use annihilation into mu's. Um, well, for W's, the constraint would be at about 100 GeV dark matter, but if your dark matter is much lighter than 100 GeV, it's not going to annihilate into W bosons. So this is another photon rich final state. This muon final state is one of the cases I talked about last time where you don't produce neutral pions and so you don't produce a lot of photons. And so you see the bounds here are much weaker. This doesn't intersect the thermorelic line until you're down around 10, until you're down around 10 GV. Any questions about this plot before we move on? Because the, I mean, it's because if you, because I'm going to be showing a lot of plots like this. So if there's anything that's unclear about this, we should talk about it now. Yeah? Uh, where are there uh, the sudden bumps in the black solution? So yeah, well, so, so you can see that, so, uh, so in, in these lower two images, so you can see here that this, is pre that this is being driven by the magic result, like the Fermi line is, the Fermi line is not very bumpy. Okay, so, so I guess it's a combination of two things here. One is, so this magic constraint curve, when it's switching on here, that's basically due to the experiment not being able to see lower energy gamma rays. So this sharp turn on here is you're getting up into the region where the effective area of the experiment is, is rather good. So you go from only having Fermi to having Fermi plus something else with much larger effective area. So that's why it sort of turns there. Now, why it moves around here. Um, this might be just statistics. The green band is the predicted one sigma containment. So you, w you do expect the line to move around a bit within that band. What it probably is, is that, in, is that you know, in this region, maybe there's a little bit of a downward fluctuation in the number of photons that you would expect from the dwarf. So your limit is a bit stronger than, you, than, than your naive, than your central value expectation. And then, um, and then as you go up to higher energies, there are fewer photons. Like ju just statistical fluctuations will cause the limit to move around within the green band. Make sense? 
yeah, there's a, there's a really spectacular example of this in a preliminary paper that I've seen by my student, Nick Rod, which should be coming out in a few days, where the limit at some point, the limit looks like this, and then it looks like this, and it's basically a delta function. And the reason for that is that, so it's like this, and the reason for that is that on one of their targets at like 600 GeV, there are two photons at exactly the same energy exactly sitting on their target. And so, I mean, that looks like a possible dark matter line signal, although it's two photons, so it's almost certainly just a statistical fluctuation. But that's enough to make the limits significantly worse at that particular mass scale. Okay. So that's a, this is actually from 2016, so this is a slightly older dwarf analysis by Fermi. So the most recent dwarf analysis with the 45 sources is shown here for the BB bar and the tau plus, tau minus channels. Again, you see the answer is, so um, red is the old analysis, black is the new analysis. You see that, um, I mean, they're qualitatively pretty similar. You, again, rule out roughly thermorelic dark matter below the sort of 80 to 100 GV scale. Now, you see here the limits, the black line is the new limit, so they've gotten stronger at high masses. They've actually gotten weaker at lower masses, and the reason for that is that a few of these new dwarfs and dwarf candidates discovered since the 2015 analysis have what could be little excesses in them, or they could be two sigma upward fluctuations. Okay? The, the local significance of these excesses is about three sigma. When you try to compute the global significance, you get between zero sigma and three sigma, depending, depending on how you do the calculation, how you estimate your trials factor. These little blobs over here are estimates of the cross-section that you need to explain the galactic center GV excess, which we'll talk about in more detail later. But the fact that this line sort of shifted from, so this blob here is probably, is, well, I think it's my favorite estimate of the GV excess. But as so you can see, the fact that these blobs are in different places is the statement that our different analyses get slightly different answers. And so the real systematic blob is probably something that contains all of these. Um, the fact that this line now goes through the top of the GV excess blob rather than the bottom of the GV excess blob is basically telling you that those two and three sigma excesses in, the, um, in these dwarfs are potentially consistent with the galactic center excess. So there is a coherent story where the galactic center excess and these little ex and these little possible statistical fluctuations, possible signal hints in the dwarfs might be coming from the same um, might be coming from the same from the same dark matter source. I don't think that's actually the case, so I'll tell you that now, but uh, but there is a coherent uh, case where that is true. So these are the results just from Fermi. If we look at the higher energy results from Veritas, looking at the dwarfs, they look like this. So you can see this is at 10 TeV, this upper limit here. You can see that for Veritas, it's pretty, at least in 2050, it was pretty hard to catch up with Fermi even at these high scales. This is a more recent result from Veritas in, in 2017. And you see that it's around a few TeV where the Veritas limit starts to get stronger than the Fermi limit. There's the Hawk telescope just recently presented their first results from analysis of dwarfs. And you see that once you have Hawk, then up to about 100 TeV, you can constrain cross sections between 10 to the minus 24 and 10 to the minus 23 centimeters cubed per second. So a couple of orders of magnitude above the thermal relic range. Now, you might ask, why do we care about things that are a couple of orders of magnitude above the thermal relic range? Well, Dark matter doesn't have to be thermal, and as Neil talked about last time, it's not necessarily true that the, cross that the annihilation cross-section <coughs> in the present day is the same as it is in the early universe. But are these the strongest limits about one t above 1 TeV? Well, you can do better. This is, um, at least you can nominally do better. This is an example of the limit that you get from the galactic center using the HESS telescope if you assume that Inasto profile, which recall was one of the profiles that had a steeply rising dark matter density towards the galactic center. This is, this is in a fairly small region of the inner Milky Way. It's, about, it's a few degrees around the galactic center. So this is, this, is a very, this is a very nice limit. Again, this black dashed line is the thermal relic value. Previously, we were saying from the dwarfs, you could set limits in the sort of 10 to the minus 24 to 10 to the minus 23 range above a TV. So that's up here. So if you can trust it, this limit is significantly stronger. But if the dark matter profile has a significant density core, if the density doesn't rise as steeply as assumed here, then that will move this limit upward. 
Just for comparison, this is the Fermi dwarf constraint that we just looked at overlaid. So you can see if you take this seriously, then the um, Echerenkov telescopes looking at the galactic center do better than Fermi above about the TV scale. Now, I argued last time that the galactic center was a good place to look for Lyon signals, basically because the dark matter density might be very high and you don't need to worry very much about the background. There are Lyon limits from dwarfs as well. Um, they're, a lot, they're a lot weaker than these, although, again, this assumes that an astro profile, if the profile is called, these limits will be weaker. So these blue data points show the current limits on a Lyon signal at the galactic center from Hess. These black data points show the current limits on a Lyon signal from uh, Fermi. These purple data points show the limits on a Lyon signal from the MAGIC telescope. So you, you can see there's a, there's a bit of a gap. But the um, and, these, and this green band shows the projected sensitivity of a new HESS analysis. This, so these results were presented at ICRC 2017, um, I guess last month, it's still August. So um, keep an eye out for this result. This could potentially make these line constraints quite a lot better. This is just a simulation um, because the analysis is blind. They were, at the time they gave this talk, they were about to unblind. So, okay, so I told you earlier that I would say, well, okay, for, so, and, and also keep in mind, these cross sections are well below thermal relic, but we don't expect dark matter's dominant annihilation channel to be into gamma gamma. So we would generally expect if we did have thermal relic dark matter, the branching ratio to gamma gamma would be rather small. That's why these constraints don't immediately rule out a bunch of thermal relic dark matter models. Typically the branching ratio is 10 to the minus three or less to photons because it's loop suppressed. But there's a caveat on that, the heavy dark matter. So Neil, I think, talked last time about, about Sommerfeld enhancement. So something that was, that was appreciated back in 2004 or 2005 is that if you're talking about really WIMPs, like weakly interacting WIMPs, where weakly means with the electroweak gauge bosons, the Sommerfeld enhancement will be important once the mass of the dark matter becomes larger than the mass of the weak gauge bosons divided by the coupling. So for MW of 80 GV and alpha of about 1 over 30, this happens for dark matter heavier than about 2.5 TV. So this gives you a Sommerfeld enhancement to annihilation due to the attractive potential mediated by exchange of W bosons. So this is an example of what this looks like for Wino-like dark matter. So this is dark matter that's the superpartner of the W boson. It's part of a multiplet. There's a neutral particle, which is the dark matter, and then charged particles, the charginos, which are just slightly heavier. So that means that so that means that you can have a potential like this where W exchange couples the chi naught chi naught line to the chi plus chi minus line. Now, if you didn't have this potential there, if you just did the one loop calculation, naively, you would say, all right, this is the diagram for annihilation of we know dark matter into photons, okay? I go through this loop to chi plus chi minus and these are charged particles, so they have a tree level um, coupling to photons. But in the presence of this long range potential, the dominant diagrams are these ladder diagrams with a lot of exchanges. And so that actually means that the annihilation rate to gamma gamma is no longer effectively suppressed by a loop factor. It's effectively like a tree level Sommerfeld enhanced process. So for these high mass dark matter particles, it's possible both the Sommerfeld enhancement is present, just the attractive interaction can increase the enhancement by one to two orders of magnitude, but for Lyon signals, it also effectively removes the loop suppression. Um, I mean, it's still not, and the branching ratio for this channel is still not like 50% or anything just because the coupling of photons is alpha electroweak, it is uh, alpha E and M. So this is 1 over 137, which is a fair bit smaller than alpha weak. But, um, but it's an appreciable branching ratio. So as a consequence, if you take this scenario of we know light dark matter, which is a popular Susie wimp, and you ask what are the line constraints, on this Wiener dark matter. So this plot on the left is an estimate of the cross section to produce Lyon photons for, um, for Wiener dark matter. And you see that these cross sections are, okay, so first you see these resonance effects. This is a Sommerfeld effect. This is coming from zero energy, near zero energy bound states in the potential. 
you see there are a lot of lines on this plot. This is because this calculation is actually qu kind of subtle. Those of you who know what Sudikov logarithms are, there are large logs in this problem that come from the ratio of the dark matter mass to the W mass. So you need to take those into account simultaneously with the Sommerfeld enhancement. This green line is what you would get if you just took the tree level cross section and multiplied by the Sommerfeld enhancement. This the pink line is what you would get if you just did the one loop calculation. You can see that answer gets very wrong above about a TV. And then these uh, red and blue bands are calculations from an effective field, field theory calculation that my collaborators and I, as well as other groups, did back in 2014. This calculation is now up to um, NLL prime, including all the extra loop effects, and that's the green line on this band. So this is the best prediction of the line signal at the moment. But you can see that if you don't take into account these Sudikov effects, you get the difference between the green lines and the red lines, which is like a factor of four. So this is a case where theoretical precision that is better than predicting your signal within a factor of three or four actually requires some sophistication. So we see that the cross-section to lines in, in these models can be around that thermorelic cross-section or, or significantly higher at late times. So then this plot on the right shows how that compares to existing line constraints. So those blue lines are the, li are the existing line limit from Hess. This is again assuming a cusped profile. This is an NFW profile at the galactic center. So you see that again if, you, if our galaxy does indeed have a dark matter cusp then you can rule out we know light dark matter being all the dark matter below a mass scale of about 4 TeV. And the natural thermal scale for this dark matter where you get the right thermorelic density is about 2.5 to 3 TeV. So it's in this region here. Now, I'll show you next what happens if our dark matter density profile has a core. But um, if with the with the CTA telescope, which is the next generation ground-based gamma ray telescope, a Cherenkov telescope, we should be able to push the constraints down to this brown line. So you can ask, okay, but this is assuming a peak density profile of the galactic center. So here's a plot of what the density looks like, a log-log plot of what the density looks like as a function of radius. So these red and um, blue dashed lines are for the INASTO and NFW profiles. So these are these simulation motivated profiles that I told you about earlier. And then these other two lines are two variants on chord profiles. This is the so-called isothermal core model, where the density profile is assumed to go something like 1 over r squared and then flatten off at small radii. So in this case, the case with a 0.5 kiloparsec core actually has a much higher density at the center than the INASTO or NFW profiles because of this strong 1 over r squared scaling. So that, that's probably unrealistic. But this scenario is sort of a, this purple dash line is sort of a worst case scenario. This is the case where the density profile of the dark matter just flattens off inside the solar circle. So this is a 10 kiloparsec core. And this is about the largest core that is really plausible from observations or simulations. So this plot shows what allowed fraction of dark matter you could have in we know dark matter. Um, this black dash line shows how, what fraction of dark matter you would have in we know dark matter if it was a thermal relic. So this yellow dot here is the thermal case where the natural we know annihilation cross section explains 100% of the dark matter. And so then these lines are showing for each of these density profiles how much dark matter fraction could you, could you potentially have in we know dark matter. So these two lines that are close together are the INASTO and NFW profiles motivated by simulation. So they say that at this thermal mass with present constraints, you couldn't have more than about 20 or 30% of the dark matter being this we know. So this, this line, and this line is ruled out down like 1.5 TV, and it being 100% of the dark matter is ruled out down to 0.5 TV, and or below once you take into account the Fermi constraints, mm -hmm. too. But um, if we had this line here, is the case of a 10 kiloparsec core. So in that probably maximally pessimistic scenario, um, you it would still be okay to have 100% of the dark matter be thermal winos. But with the CTA bound, and this is with just five hours of CTA observation, could, you could potentially push the constraint significantly beyond that. This thermorelic we know line would be pretty much exactly on the at the detectability of CTA. So with better gamma ray telescopes, we can actually start to make galactic center constraints that are fairly robust to the uncertainties in the dark matter density profile. Yep. Right. So it's because the cross section, ha like the, these these bumps here. Yeah. 
Right. So it's because there the natural cross-section is very high because of resonances in the sum of fold enhancement. So it's exactly the inverse of this picture here. <coughs> At specific values of the dark matter mass, you get an extremely large cross-section because there's a resonant enhancement to the sum of fold, um, to the sum of fold effect. And so there, you know, you see even if the dark matter was pretty cored, because the cross-section is so high, you, um, you would expect to see a signal. Since we haven't seen a signal so far, modulo the Hess blinded analysis that should be coming out pretty soon, um, that tells us that only a small fraction of the dark matter could be present. Okay. Okay. So those are the con so those are the leading constraints on photon rich channels or line channels for GeV plus dark matter annihilation. You can do something. You can do something very similar for dark matter decay. This is a nice recent paper which just looked at a bunch of different channels on, constraints on decaying dark matter from dwarf galaxies, galaxy clusters, the extragalactic gamma ray background, and the halo in which we're embedded using both data from Fermi and neutrino data from IceCube. And so this solid red line is their limit from Fermi. This dashed red line is their limit based on the IceCube neutrinos. So as we talked about last time, it's sufficiently high masses. The neutrino experiments can actually be pretty important. This is for dark matter annihilation to um, th this is for dark matter annihilation of equals. Now note this is a decay plot, not a density plot. So everything with lifetimes below this level are excluded, rather than lifetimes above this level being excluded. Longer lifetime means um, means weaker constraints. So. You see here that these lifetime lower limits are basically in the 10 to the 27 to 10 to the 28 second range, as we said earlier, about uh, 10 orders of magnitude longer than the age of the universe, for mass scales from about 10 GeV up to the 10 to the 10 GeV range. The green and blue regions on this plot are showing where you would need to be if you want to explain the high energy neutrinos that have been observed by IceCube as a signal from like, PEV decaying dark matter. Um, I'm not going to talk very much about that anomaly because pretty much everyone who I've talked to believes that those neutrinos are astrophysical. But if you did want to fit it with decaying dark matter, this is where you need to be. And you can see that most of this region is ruled is excluded by Fermi bounds. If you go up to very heavy dark matter annihilation, so this is an old paper from 2012. So as we saw recently, for most of these channels, the constraints on heavy dark matter annihilating into these channels are more like it did the 10 to the minus 24, 10 to the minus 23 level, up to the 100 TV mass scale, which is here. I just want to show you this to remind you of this unitarity limit, which um, cuts in and forces the cross section to be below a certain value. Out to one. So you see that for a, cross a thermal cross section of 3 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second, well, on, on this plot, this unitary limit is somewhat higher than I think the other calculations of the unitarity bound. So they may be taking into account some extra effects. But broadly, this is the region that we look at for thermal, for thermal limbs. Okay, so that's what we can say at the moment for annihilation of dark matter at a GV and higher into channels that are not like, full of cosmic rays, basically to channels that have some significant photon contribution. What about at light mass scales? What if we look? Uh, what if we go below the GV scale? Well, in some ways, in that case, the situation is much simpler because you can't annihilate or decay into most of the standard model final states into W bosons or protons, or antiprotons, or um, you know, or many of the quarks can't go into B quarks. Basically, you can go to electrons and positrons, photons, and neutrinos. If you're between 100 MeV and a GeV, you could also go to pions and so on. But once you get down well below a GeV, then these are your options, because these are the only particles in the standard model light enough. As a result, we talked about this last time, you don't get those photon-rich continuum spectra. Um, you can either get a photon line, or you can get photons as part of radiation from an electron and positron as final state radiation or initial state radiation. That spectrum also tends to be rather hard. So often for models like this, if you don't have a strong branching ratio just to photons, the best thing to do is to look for the electrons and positrons. So we'll talk about those cosmic ray constraints and about the CMB constraints, which are really strong on these models later on. But for channels that do produce a lot of photons, the strongest limits on decaying dark matter come from studying gamma rays from the Milky Way halo. So this plot is a picture of what the isotropic diffuse gamma ray background, so the gamma ray, the gamma ray bath that surrounds us, looks like from astrophysical observations from the tens of keV scale up to the 
uh, up to the 100 GeV scale. So these green points are from Fermi, which we already looked at. And then all these other measurements are from older gamma ray telescopes, from EGRET, which was the precursor to Fermi, CompTEL, um, from the Integral Telescope, and down here we're getting into the X-ray band. At even lower energies, you have a whole host of X-ray telescopes. I'll show you the results from that yet. Next. But this sort of hundreds of keV to GeV region is actually not very well constrained compared to the other compared to the other regions that we'll look at. Nonetheless, you can take all these data and you can say, all right, suppose I had dark matter annihilating or decaying, making a photon spectrum that could be a lion or could be a spectrum from final state radiation or initial state radiation. Now the backgrounds in this region are pretty hard to model, so let me just require that the photon spectrum not overproduce this result, that I not actually predict more photons than are seen by these experiments. If you do this, then you get constraints like this. These are by these papers from Essig and Zurich and collaborators a few years ago. So for dark matter decaying directly into photons, you set a constraint on the light. So this is the constraint on the lifetime from these various experiments. And you can see that, again, from about the tens of kV scale up to the tens of GeV scale, it's the constraint is between a few times 10 to the 26 and 10 to the 28 seconds, similar to what it was at higher masses. If you have decay into electrons and positrons that then produces photons um, through FSR, which is final state radiation, then the limits are quite a bit weaker because this diagram is suppressed by a factor of alpha relative to, um, relative to just phi goes to e plus e minus. And so you see that the lifetime for this decay can be constrained at the level of about 10 to the 24 to 10 to the 25 seconds. And if you have dark matter, this is a case for dark matter annihilating into e plus e minus. So these constraints, so this is showing the this is showing the cross section at a velocity typical of our galactic halo. So you can ex interpret that as just the cross section for S wave annihilation. If you have velocity suppressed P wave annihilation, then this is the cross section at our at our galactic halo. So now this black line on this plot is the is the constraint from the CMB, which I'll talk about in more detail later. So you notice that all these lines are well above this line of the CMB constraint. So for S-wave annihilation, so what I was saying earlier, this is looking at the photons is not the best way to look for light uh, annihilating dark matter. But for P-wave annihilation, these constraints can be competitive because there the CMB bounds go up to these dashed lines. Um, and, you can, and you can constrain these cross sections which are thermal or a little higher. Well, okay, sorry. They're not thermal P wave cross sections. There will be thermal cross sections for S wave. For P wave, the actual thermal cross section is um, uh, is the thermal cross section pr projected forward to our galaxy would be a lot smaller than this. P wave annihilation is just generically hard to constrain with indirect detection. You probably want to use a collider or direct detection experiments instead. When you go down to even lower masses, you see here, this is this integral telescope whose results we were looking at. On the next slide, you go down to even lower masses, we have constraints from the Chandra New Star telescopes, not shown on here, but there are other X-ray telescopes, XMM, Newton, and Suzaku. These basically cover the range from below a keV up to order 100 keV. So, so you see New Star caps out, well, New Star caps out at a few tens of GV, keV here. So, Putting these telescopes together, we can cover the whole range for thermal dark matter from the KV warm dark matter limit up to the 100 TV unitarity bound. This is a constraint on decay. This is specifically on sterile neutrino decay. So it's parameterized in terms of the mixing angle. So this is decay to photons with a long lifetime. Um, and so, so this line here is, a, is about sterile neutrino parameter space. These, this region is what's allowed by various production mechanisms. But if you want to convert this into a lifetime limit, you'll see that the kinds of lifetimes we're constraining are, again, at the sort of 10 to the 28 to 10 to the 30 second level. This dot here is the 3.5 kV line anomaly, which, again, we'll, we'll talk about later. So sterile neutrinos are pretty constrained. By, um, by, these, by these limits. There's maybe a little window still available here at small mixing angle and masses of about 7 keV up to a couple of tens of keV. Okay, 
So that's basically what we can do with photons. That's basically the list of experiments that give us meaningful constraints on KV to 100 TV gamma rays coming from dark matter annihilation or decay. So what if we look at cosmic rays? Well, the leading experiment for cosmic ray detection at the moment is AMS-02, which is up on the space station. If any of you guys have seen the movie Gravity, they act, the space station actually has AMS on it. If you know what you're looking for, you can uh, see, see AMS fly by. But, um, so AMS has presented measurements of a range of different cosmic ray spectra. They have a magnet, so they can tell the difference between positively and negatively charged particles. And in particular, they can measure, um, they can measure antimatter. So for dark matter searches, the most relevant, well, with a possible exception, which I'll mention later, the most relevant searches are looking for the antimatter, so looking for positrons and antiprotons. This is just because there's a lot more matter than antimatter in our galaxy, but we'd expect dark matter annihilation or decay to produce matter and antimatter in equal quantities. So if, if we see a significant rise in the ratio of antimatter to matter, then, or, or a bump in that ratio, then we might expect that to be a signal of dark matter annihilation. So these plots are showing their results for the antiproton to proton ratio as a function of energy. That's these black dash points. The blue points are from the previous experiment, the Pamela experiment. And this is showing, well, I'll show you the more updated results on um, a little bit later. But this is a measurement of the positron fraction, so the ratio of positrons to electrons plus positrons as a function of energy. Now, should mention, there aren't a lot of ambient antiprotons and positrons in our galaxy. So the usual picture before these results was that these antiprotons and positrons are all produced as secondaries. They're produced when other cosmic rays interact with the interstellar gas, and that makes a bunch of, that makes a bunch of antiprotons and positrons. As we, talked, as we said last time, it's a fairly generic prediction from diffusive propagation that secondaries should have should have softer spectra, less power at high energies than objects that are direct, than particles that are directly accelerated in supernovae. So the expectation was that this positron to electron ratio should fall smoothly as a function of energy. And clearly around about 10 GeV, it stops doing that and it turns around and it goes up. So this suggests either some significant modification to propagation or that there's some new primary source of positrons that we haven't accounted for. So again, I'll talk about that more in the anomalies section, but it's been a long. But so you can use these data to set limits on dark matter annihilation and decay, although complicated by the fact that at least in the positrons, we clearly don't fully understand what is going on. So these are the kinds of results that you get from annihilation constraints to the um, for anti from antiprotons. Uh, th so these are for different channels. So you see for these channels annihilation to B quarks or W bosons, which produce a lot of quarks. They decay, they hadronize, they produce antiprotons. You can set constraints on the uh, cross-section that are comparable to the constraints we get from the dwarf, i.e. that it's hard to have the thermorelic cross-section below about 100 GV. The constraints on leptonic channels are a lot weaker. So this shows some of those astrophysical uncertainties on the constraints. What happens if you change the halo profile or you change the parameters of the cosmic ray propagation? So these constraints are not quite as, um, uh, probably not quite as robust as those from the dwarfs, but they provide a complementary probe because the uncertainties in the dwarf constraints mostly come from uncertainties in how much dark matter is there in the dwarfs, really. The uncertainties here come from something that should be completely independent from the propagation parameters. So again, this sort of antiproton limits basically just say, okay, it's hard to have thermorelic dark matter annihilating the hadron-rich channels below about 100 GV with S-wave annihilation. Now, if we look at the electron and positron data, well, you might say at first, well, hang on, there's this huge bump in the electron-positron data. How can you set any reasonable constraints at all? Well, you can still do a bump hunt. If you have some, that you saw that that curve was pretty smooth, as we talked about last time, you can, if you have injection of electrons and positrons from dark matter annihilation, like dark matter, dark matter to E plus E minus, that will produce a sharp endpoint. So you can look for that endpoint. You can look for a feature. So even if your background looks like this, you're looking for something that looks like this on top of it. So that's his constraints on annihilation directly to electrons and positrons and to a lesser degree annihilation to muons 
or to E plus E minus gamma that are quite a bit stronger. You see that these get to the thermorelic cross section at masses of about 200 GeV, and they can constrain pretty small branching ratios into electrons and positrons at lower, at lower masses. Again, there are significant uncertainties associated with the cosmic ray propagation and production, though. But these are the best limits I know on annihilation directly to electrons and positrons in this mass range. Now, but you'll notice here that both the data I showed you and all the limits here cut off at masses around a GV. So why is that? Well, <coughs> the problem with measuring cosmic rays below about a GV is that we live in a solar system. And there is a solar wind that does a pretty good job of deflecting low energy cosmic rays. We do see some low energy cosmic rays, but we can't really measure the interstellar spectrum because it will be very distorted by the magnetic field of the sun. And positively and negatively charged particles can get deflected in different ways, so even looking at these ratios is, is not very helpful. But, so it turns out, and I, I, I just found this very cool when I found out about it, that the best limits on sub-GV cosmic rays come from Voyager. <laughs> come from Voyager 1, because it's now outside the solar system. It's beyond the heliopause, and when it crossed the heliopause, they saw a dramatic change in the number of low-energy cosmic rays that it was seeing, which is what you would expect, because the solar wind deflects them when you're inside the solar system. So Voyager now gives us a... So it's not quite true that we can only measure cosmic rays in the neighborhood of the Earth. Voyager now allows us to measure cosmic rays out beyond the solar system and get a better measurement of what the cosmic ray spectrum looks like when it's not affected by our sun. So um, it can't measure very high energy cosmic rays. I mean, the spectrometer was built several decades ago. But this provides the best limits on 10 MeV to GeV dark matter decaying to electrons and positrons. And it would provide the best limits on annihilation, except the CMB limits are better. So this is from a paper last year by Budabara where they show the constraints on the um, where they show the constraints on the annihilation cross section and on the decay uh, and on the decay from Voyager and you see now these don't have systematic errors on them so take them with a bit of a grain of salt but you can see that for um, annihilation into E plus E minus below the GV scale which if you have sub GV GM is probably going to be one of the major or the major annihilation channels you can go down well below the thermal value and for, and for decaying dark matter, we can constrain lifetimes again in this 10 to the 26, 10 to the 27 range, whereas with the observations of the photons from E plus E minus gamma final states, we could only constrain lifetimes down here. So. Old telescopes can still be very useful. Okay, so that's what we can do with photons, that's what we can do with cosmic rays. What about neutrinos, our last channel? So it, for the neutrinos, there are three major experiments at the moment. There's Super Cameo Candy, which studies low energy, relatively low energy neutrinos from about the few MeV to the TV range. Antares, which covers about the 100 GV to 100 TV range, is in the water, it's in the ocean. And Ice Cube, where the detectors are buried in the ice at the South Pole, which covers, starts at a similar energy range to Antares, but goes up higher. So, as we said last time, these experiments give you unique sensitivity if neutrinos are the main annihilation product because they go up to such high energies. As we saw earlier, they can also set really competitive constraints on sufficiently high mass annihilating or decaying dark matter. So these are the current constraints on from looking at the galactic center with Super Cameo Candy. As always, galactic center constraint is going to be a dependence on the abundance about the density and the abundance of the density profile. But uh, this so these show their limits for um, so these show their limits for neutrinos and for the other um, particles. Now you see for everything that's not neutrinos, these cross section limits, ten to the minus twenty three, ten to the minus twenty one centimeters cubed per second. These are and this is in a mass scale of one GV to one TV. These limits are a fair bit weaker than what we would get from photons. But for neutrinos, this is this is really the only game in town. You see, though, that we're still a fair way away from constraining thermorelic dark matter that annihilates 100% to neutrinos through this channel. So then these are new results shown in ICRC about the higher energy limits from Ice Cube and from Antares. And these are this dash line is the Hess Galactic Center Limit that I showed you earlier. So again, for neutrinos, this is really the only game in town. This is for a non-neutrino channel. This is dark matter annihilating to tau leptons. And at sufficiently high masses, the neutrino telescopes can actually take over from the gamma rays. 
Okay. So now let's go just back to the very beginning, this whole discussion when I talked about early universe bounds. I talked about limits from BBN and how the fact that you'd expect 100 GeV dark matter annihilating at a thermal relic rate to inject about an MeV of energy per baryon at, um, at, at BBN. What are the effects of that? Well, this is, this is, a, this is from a review from 2010 by Jadamsic and Pospilov. Um, there's an interesting paper by Pullen and Serpico from 2015 which talks about how some of the standard assumptions made in this BBN literature can be pretty incorrect. Uh, I haven't, fa I, on a quiz search I did not find a significantly more up-to-date constraint on this from BBN, which I guess makes sense since we haven't had a lot of new BBN data in the last few years. But, uh, but this is the ballpark of where the constraints are. You're, this is mo it's most constraining for BBN if your dark matter annihilation or decay produces a lot of extra hadrons. So for hadronic channels, the bounds are strongest. These are bounds from not messing up the lithium abundances too much in BBN. And this is constraining cross-sections. You see um, an order of magnitude or two above thermal relic for roughly weak scale dark matter. So this is not the strongest constraint that we'll see today, but just to close the loop with what we talked about earlier, you can still get meaningful constraints on dark matter annihilation from BBM. If there was some small fraction of the dark matter which decayed in the early universe with a short lifetime, so we didn't see it decay, it didn't contribute to the dark matter that we talked about today, it was just an early metastable species, then BBN can set limits on that too. You can set limits basically on decays with lifetimes between 0.01 and 10 to the 12 seconds. Again, that would not be the dark matter we see today, it would be some metastable species, but BBN is really only the, the only way to probe such short lifetimes short of laboratory experiments, which will probably not see something that decays in 10 to the 12 seconds. Okay. So the last constraint that I want to talk about, and that I want to talk about in a little bit more detail, is the constraints from the cosmic microwave background which as I've said and as you've heard from Neil, are especially powerful for constraining low mass dark matter. Okay, so suppose I want to do a, con a calculation of how the CMB constrains light dark oh, Well, okay, I'll just pause for a moment because I've just said a lot without any questions. So are there any questions at this stage before I jump into this? Okay. So if I want to figure out how the... So as we said earlier, the basic mechanism is that Dark matter annihilation can produce a lot of ionizing, a lot of extra ionizing particles. Those ionizing particles can ionize the hydrogen in the early universe after recombination and before ionization when the baseline ionization fraction is very low. Those extra electrons act like a screen to the cosmic microwave background radiation. When cosmic microwave background photons scatter off them, it changes the anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background and we can measure those perturbations to the CMB anisotropies. So if you want to do this calculation, you start with the dark matter model. So the, this is just purely from the dark matter model. You inject high energy particles um, and you decay them into the stable standard model particles. Those decay, like decays of the W boson, decays of the Z, decays of the Higgs, those all happen very fast relative to all the other time scales we're thinking about. A recombination the age of the universe is about three or four hundred thousand years. So most, particle, most decays of particles that we know about happen on time scales quite a bit shorter than that. So then we want to look at, so what can you make? You can make photons, electrons, positrons, protons, antiprotons, and neutrinos. The neutrinos get away. The protons and antiprotons, um, the protons and antiprotons are a lot more penetrating than the electrons and positrons. They will lose some of their energy, but usually, but in the results I'm going to show you, we're actually going to ignore the protons and antiprotons. This is justified because um, they lose less of their energy than the f <coughs> electrons and positrons and photons, and usually protons and antiprotons are a pretty small branching ratio in a given dark matter model. If you have a dark matter model that goes 100% to protons and antiprotons, somehow you should reconsider this constraint. But generally, if you're making protons and antiprotons, it means you're making quarks. If you're making quarks, you're going to hadronize and make neutral pions and charged pions as well, usually much more abundantly than the protons and antiprotons. And when those decays, they'll make a lot of electrons and photons and positrons. So we can just focus on the electrons, photons, and positrons. Then we need to know how these particles cool down and lose their energy. If I just ask what is the ionization cross-section of a 1 TeV um, photon, it's really, really tiny. The time scale for that ionization is much longer than the age of the universe at recombination. But that's not the only thing that that photon can do. It can scatter on the background radiation, it can potentially pair produce. So, you produce, so you'll produce a cascade of secondary particles, which we need to, which we need to model. Then you need to ask, okay, 
So now we've got this cascade of secondary particles. What do they do to ionizing the hydrogen, exciting the hydrogen, heating up the gas? Um, figure out what the changes are to the ionization history. So you can do this basically by modifying public codes, which translate extra energy and ionize extra energy in these channels into what the actual ionization history is. And then once you've got the perturbations, the ionization history, fortunately there are excellent public codes that will say, okay, this is your new ionization history. Here are your perturbations to the CMP. Now, if we had to do this for every single dark matter model, this would be a very this would be a very cumbersome process. You could set up a code pipeline to do it, but it actually turns out that um, this entire process can basically be rolled into one number. For dark matter annihilation, S-wave annihilation, pretty much independent of what spectrum of high energy particles you inject, uh, with what rate you inject them, the shape of the perturbation of the CMB anisotropies is exactly the same. And, and I'll demonstrate this to you in a sec. So that means that essentially all we need to know is what is the normalization factor. All these steps boil down to calculating an efficiency factor for dark matter to convert its energy into CMB anisotropies. And that, we can work out the efficiency factors independently for photons and electrons and positrons at different energies. The problem is approximately linear. We can just take a linear combination to get the effective efficiency that you want for any dark matter model. Okay. But how do we actually do this calculation if you didn't know this and we're just going from first principles? Well, so what you need to model is that when you inject electrons into the early universe, they can inverse Compton scatter on the CMB. So that takes their energy, transfers it to a CMB photon, you get a high energy photon. This is the main cooling process for electrons. So to a first approximation, as soon as you dump electrons into the early universe, they convert their energy to photons and you just have to worry about how the photons cool down. Low energy electrons can excite or ionize or heat the gas directly. Low energy positrons will eventually annihilate, making more photons. All of these processes for electrons are pretty fast relative to Hubble time, so basically what all the processes for electrons do is produce some amount of ionization, excitation, and heating, and then make photons. So what do the photons do? Well, as I said, at high energies, they can pair produce on the CMB, make secondary electrons, which then turn back into photons, which then give you more photons. They can scatter on the CMB, partition the energy between the original photon and the CMB photon. They can pair produce on the gas. They can Compton scatter off, the, uh, off any electrons that are around. And at low energies, below, um, about below a few kV, the photoionization rate becomes really, really rapid. So the point of these processes for the signal that we're looking at is to degrade the energy of the photons down from one TV photon into 10 to the 6 kV photons, at which point you, at, at which point you, just, you produce a lot of extra ionization. Now, with the exception of the first and last of these processes, all of these intermediate processes have cooling times comparable to a Hubble time. This means two things. One, not every photon is going to convert its TeV of energy into 10 to the 6 keV photons. There are photons that just free stream to the present day, appear in present day gamma ray backgrounds. Two, a particle can go through this scattering process and photoionize things long after it was first injected. So there's a delay. So you can't assume, you can't leave out the redshifting, and you can't assume that if I inject energy at some redshift, it will immediately change the ionization history at that redshift. Here's an example of how this changes the of how this changes the ionization history and the effects on the CMB when you go through this calculation. So this solid line is the ionization fraction of hydrogen. This line at the bottom is the ionization fraction of hydrogen with no dark matter, and then these lines show what happens as you turn up the amount of dark matter annihilation. So basically, the effect of adding dark matter annihilation is to give you this slowly is to raise the plateau for the ionization level at late times. This is for S-wave annihilation. As I said, because there's a delay in deposition, the details of these curves will depend on um, what energy you injected the particle at, because that determines how long it takes to degrade to the energies where you can photoionize things. But dark matter annihilation goes like density squared. This means it goes like 1 plus redshift to the 6. It's like 1 plus e to the 6. So uh, that 1 plus e to the 6 scaling essentially completely washes out the effects of the delayed deposition in terms of the effect on the shape of the ionization history. The delay in deposition can change the, uh, can change the normalization, but the shape is pretty consistent between different dark matter models. Um, only the normalization changes. So then if we say, all right, 
With this increased ionization history, what does this do to what we'll call the last scattering surface? So this plot is basically measuring at what redshift did CMB photons last scatter off something on average. Again, bottom line down here is the case where there's no dark matter annihilation. So when we talk about the last scattering surface, we mean most CMB photons last scattered between shifts of a few weight of like 800 and 1200. That's this peak. As we turn on dark matter annihilation, what happens is that this late plateau in the ionization history means that more CMB photons scattered at late times. So this essentially gives us a tail on the surface of last scattering extending the lower edge shift. This damps out CMB anisotropies on scales that are essentially smaller than the width of this last scattering surface. So if you think of the CMB as taking a snapshot of the anisotropies of the universe at the last scattering surface, that snapshot is blurred out by the fact that it's really a superposition of snapshots from redshift 900 and redshift 1000 and redshift 1100, depending on when a given CMB photon last scattered. Once a bunch of CMB photons are also scattering at later times, then you add in snapshots from later times as well, and those snapshots can destructively interfere with these earlier ones. So for, so for um, oscillations which had length scales that were sort of smaller than the, which were larger than the width of this, so they weren't really subject to this interference before, but smaller than the width of this extended last scattering surface, you get a damping in the CMB anisotropies. So this is a picture of what this looks like. So extra ionization from dark matter, it suppresses the um, temperature anisotropies in the CMB just because there are more photons. So there are more electrons for the CMB photons to scatter off and be disrupted. Um, but it also changes the shape with respect to L. So black line is the default. Dashed lines show what happens as you turn on dark matter annihilation in the temperature anisotropies and the polarization anisotropies and in the cross correlation between temperature and polarization. But as you might have expected, just from looking at that ionization history plot, this effect is pretty much universal. It doesn't matter very much if you injected your energy in 1 keV photons or 1 TeV photons or 100 GeV electrons and positrons. The only thing that that does is it changes the overall efficiency of how much of that power you injected gets converted to ionization. But apart from that, the shape of the effect on the CMB is, is pretty much or always the same. We can make that so we, we can make that a bit more sharp by doing a couple of things. So first let's take something that is even much more general than dark matter annihilation. Let's just say suppose that I had some energy being absorbed into the gas to go into ionization and excitation and heating at different redshifts. So not taking into account some physical model of the energy injection, just at some time for some reason there was a bunch of extra ionization in the CMB. And you can ask what change does that have on the CMB? And you know, even then, so this shows the distortions to the temperature temperature power spectrum for injections at redshifts ranging from like Z equals 90 to Z equals 1300. Now, this is normalized so that if it corresponded to annihilation, each of these curves would correspond to the same annihilation cross section. So that means the power injector is scaling basically like 1 plus e to the 6. Okay. So I want you to take two things from this plot. First, it's the intermediate redshifts that give the biggest signal here for a given annihilation cross section. These yellow and orange bands correspond to redshifts about 400 and 600. <laughs> The reason for that is that there are two countervailing effects here. One is that at late times, the dark matter annihilation rate is much smaller, goes like 1 plus e to the 6. But on the other hand, at really early times, like at this e equals 1200 line, this universe is already completely ionized. It doesn't matter how much energy you put in. You can't ionize hydrogen where it's already completely ionized. So these two countervailing effects mean that the dominant signal comes from areas where the annihilation rate is still pretty large, but the background ionization fraction is extremely low. So for an, when you, sometimes you'll hear people say for the CMB, oh, the annihilation signal peaks around redshift 600. That's what this means. If you have an, annihila an annihilation-like signal, most of the effect on the CMB is, coming from around, is going to come from around redshifts 500 or 600. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is that these curves are somewhat different, but they're not drastically different. You can actually show that the space spanned by these curves is approximately three-dimensional. Like those first three directions explain the vast majority of the variance. If we say, okay, now let's move back away from this unphysical scenario where we just have ionization happens randomly at redshift 500, and what happens, then that space essentially collapses down to one dimension. Because even with these completely general energy injections, the effect on the CMB is pretty similar. For dark matter annihilation, it's more similar again. 
The way that we make this quantitative is that we perform what's called a principal component analysis. So we consider the space of CMB signals produced by annihilation-like or decay-like signals from, part of, from uh, electrons or positrons injected at every energy scale from a keV up to tens of TeV. We put in each of those models, we work out the effect on the CMB, and then we estimate the detectability of each of those signals and the covariances between them. So for those of you who know something about Fisher matrix methods, basically what we're doing is putting in the change to the CLs for each model, contracting it with the inverse covariance matrix of the CMB. So this Fisher matrix is a measure of how detectable a given signal is. And the soft diagonal components tell you about correlations between the different signals. Then we can diagonalize this Fisher matrix to get the eigenvectors. This gives us an orthogonal basis of the perturbations to the CMB, which are ranked by the eigenvalue. And it turns out that for dark matter annihilation, the eigenvalue for the first eigenvector is huge compared to all the other eigenvalues. It explains more than 99% of the variance. What that means is that, as we said, basically all of these signals are highly, highly correlated. They all point in the same direction in the CMB. They just have different normalizations. So that tells you that all you need to compute is uh, the, yeah, okay, all you need to compute is this efficiency factor. So this is this energy-dependent efficiency factor. Uh, the green and the red lines are just two different methods of computing it. Red should be more accurate. Green was a simple approximation to it that I wanted to test out. It's from a paper I wrote in 2015. So these are the efficiency factors for, um, oh, did I not label this? These are, for electron, these are for electron positron pairs injected with this following energy. These are for photons injected with energies in this range. This is kinetic energy for the electrons. So if you have an arbitrary dark matter model, you just need to work out how many electrons and positrons and photons it produces, work out the weighted effective efficiency for that model by integrating over this curve, and then that tells you everything you need to know about the effect of your dark matter annihilation model on the CMB. And these efficiency factors, as well as the stuff that goes into them, is available at this website. So, Okay, so now you've got your efficiency factor. How do you set the limits? So Planck presented bounds on the dark matter annihilation that are expressed in terms of this efficiency factor times the annihilation cross-section as a function of mass. Now you'll note this is a very straight line. That's because this limit is really just on the efficiency factor times the annihilation cross-section divided by the mass. So everything above this blue line is ruled out. This, um, this red band was sort of the range of thermal relic values for sigma v is thermal relic and ff ranges between like 0.1 and 0.8, 0.2 and 0.8. So this is their thermal relic band. And you can see here that they, ex they would rule they, with, within this band, they expected to be rule, able to rule out thermal relic dark matter below about the 10 GeV to several to 30 or 40 GeV scale, depending on the channel. So. This plot on the right-hand side shows what happens if you actually put in the explicit values of F effective for various standard model two-body final states. So the red lines are for annihilation directly into electrons or positrons or photons. They have the highest F effective values because uh, you don't need to worry about losses into neutrinos and so on. All these other bands show the results for all the other standard model final states except direct annihilation to neutrinos. So this is all quarks, Higgs bosons, all gauge bosons. The reason why their F effectives are somewhat smaller is because a significant fraction of their power is just going into neutrinos, which is gay. So, so you see here, I mean, for elect so this is about the thermal relic value. So for annihilation into electrons or positrons or photons, you rule out um, Dark, therm, dark matter masses with thermal cross-section below about 30 or 40 GeV, and for the uh, other channels, you generally rule out masses below about 10 GeV. And for neutrinos, there's a constraint at about sigma V of 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 23 centimeters cubed per second at high masses. This is just coming from the fact that the neutrinos can radiate W or Z bosons as well. This gray region is, and, and these red regions, are estimates for the kind of cross-sections that you would need to explain the Pamela positron signal with dark matter. The red points are for models that do it with direct annihilation to electrons and photons, so, so these should be compared to the red lines. This gray region is from a range of other standard model channels. So it seems, uh, at least nominally, that the dark matter annihilation explanation for those positrons is somewhat in conflict with these CMB bands. 
And, and this is the result at low masses. Once you go below a GeV, I've only shown the results for electron and photon channels here. This is for like annihilation to two electrons, to two photons, and to four electrons. And um, you see that this goes down to scales much below the thermorelic mass. And these, these wiggles are just coming from the fact that, um, that the efficiency curves have a non-trivial shape as a function of energy. Any questions at this stage? Does this make sense? Right. So from re so yeah, so reionization is another question which I which I didn't put on here. So for S wave annihilation, it turns out that while in the epoch of reionization you have dark matter halos that have started to form, um, the effects are still they're just completely washed out by this one plus e to the six. Factor. So for annihilation, even if you include the halos, the dominant signal comes from high redshifts. You can ask, consistent with these constraints, how much of a change can S-wave annihilation make to the ionization level at reionization? And it's sub-percent level. We can't measure the ionization level that well during reionization at the moment. So at the moment, this is not very constraining. For decay or P-wave annihilation, the circumstances... So I'll show you the decay constraints from the CMB for a moment. But there, the circumstances are actually somewhat better. There are cases, well, at least prior to the Voyager results, there were example models for decay where you could have decaying dark matter, like changing the ionization level by 20%. Like, so in the sense of it goes from 0 to 20% to 20 of the hydrogen is ionized uh, immediately before reionization. And those models also um, had pretty substantial heating effects on the early universe so, um, and were not ruled out by anything else. They may now be ruled out by the specific benchmark model we looked at might now be ruled out by those Voyager <coughs> results. But yeah, so, so people have also talked about decaying dark matter models at these late times can change the ionization and thermal history of the universe enough that 21 centimeter probes might be able to see, might be able to push into new regions of parameter space, particularly for decaying dark matter. Also for P-wave annihilating, so for P-wave annihilating dark matter, you're not constrained by these high redshift CMB constraints. You get a much bigger signal at late times because then the dark matter has collapsed into bound objects and the velocity, the typical velocities are much higher, but the level of cross-section you can probe is still far below the thermal value because the velocities in the early galaxies and so on are still much, much lower than they were at freeze out. Okay, uh, yeah, question? So, uh, since this, uh, this is about the injection of energy in the photon bath, so I, I guess this would also give some spectral dispersion. Yeah, no, good, good question, yeah. So that, there's, yeah, so you're right. So the question is, do you also distort the black body spectrum of the CMB? The answer is yes. Again, the answer for S-wave annihilation is you do, but it's pretty small. And you can see this just from the estimate that we did earlier. Remember the amount of energy being dumped here was like 1 in 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 dark matter part, like a, a fraction of about 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 of energy in the dark matter getting, getting liberated. And really when you do it more carefully, it's like a 10 to the minus 11 or 10 to the minus 12 for energy in the dark matter. It's getting liberated here. Now, this is okay for ionization because the ionization energy is 10 to the is eight orders of magnitude below the mass energy and um, and we can measure changes in it at the level of 10 to the minus four so you only need to liberate about one part in 10 to the 12 of the energy stored in matter in order to meaningfully ch in order to change the ionization history in an observable way but for the CMB spectral distortions your order one measure is just like what is my fractional energy and what is my fractional change to the energy in the CMB and recombination is not that long after matter radiation equality. So if, you're lo so if you're taking 10 to the minus 12 of the energy in dark matter and converting it into photons, you would expect to be distorting the CMB. You, it turns out that you distort the CMB at the level of about 10 to the minus 10. It's so like 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10. So that, the current limits on CMB spectral distortion are at the level of 10 to the minus 5. So... So that's basically the problem here. Ionization, you get to cheat because you're comparing it to an energy scale that is much, much smaller than the overall mass scale. Spectral distortion, uh, you don't. You're just looking at total energies. Um, that said, there are plans for missions that could push our current constraints on spectral distortion down by several orders of magnitude. And in those experiments, you may... I mean, I'm actually thinking about this at the moment. You may want to get a more careful prediction of what the spectral distortion looks like as opposed to just this back-of-the-envelope estimate of total energy. I mean, there is no spectrum that you can have which will overcome a five orders of magnitude difference in the constraints. But once we're within a factor of 10 or so, 
Um, there may be also spectral distortion can constrain decays of species of like subcomponents of the dark matter that decay away before recombination. Like this constraint has nothing to say about it if the decay happened when the universe was still fully ionized. But spectral distortions could probe that sort of thing. But yeah, I, at the moment, it's yes, there is a signal. It's just five orders of magnitude <laughs> below detectability. Okay, so just an example of how, of how applicable these are. So this is for the dark photon models that Neil was talking about. So I'm not going to say much about the model because you talked about it yesterday. But as a function of the dark, if you assume the dark matter annihilation into dark photons gave you the thermal relic density and you don't use any of the dodges that Neil was talking about yesterday to evade the CMB bounds, this is what your constraint region looks like as a function of the dark matter mass and the dark photon mass. And basically below, so the green region is ruled out by the CMB. And basically if your dark photon is lighter than 100 MeV, then it pretty much doesn't matter what your dark matter mass is. Um, everything is excluded. And also everything below about 10 GeV dark matter <coughs> is, is excluded. So th this combines, this resonance structure here is coming from Sommerfeld enhancement. So this combines effects due to Sommerfeld enhancement and bound state formation and if you have a model that predicts a really high annihilation rate at low velocities, then take a look at the CMB constraints. They will probably be very strong. For decay, you can do exactly the same analysis. You can use principal component analysis, work out the effect of efficiency factors. You get efficiency factors that look like this for the decay. The signal is dominated more by about redshift 300 than redshift 600, so it's somewhat later times. This gives you constraints on decay from Planck that look like this. Again, remember, lower lifetimes are ruled out here. So these colored lines are the constraints from the diffuse gamma ray background that we looked at earlier. This is the dark matter annihilating to electrons. The CMB constraints are somewhat stronger than the diffuse gamma ray backgrounds in the whole MEV to GEV region. That's it. In this region, just below a GEV, the Voyager constraints are, I think, are stronger again. We put out this paper before the Voyager limits. That's it. These limits are really robust. They don't depend on knowing anything about the dark matter density at late times. All you have to know is atomic physics. Um, so these are probably sort of a robust backstop to the Voyager constraints, which will depend on cosmic ray propagation. You can also constrain with the CMB decays of particles that decay away during the cosmic dark ages. So they would be like a subcomponent of dark matter that lasts to the CMB but then decays away. Um, or decays from a metastable final state down to the final dark matter state that liberates some fraction of the dark matter mass energy. And basically, these are the limits here. If your lifetime, and they're what you would have expected, if your lifetime is around the age of the universe at the time of the CMB, you can't liberate more than about 10 to the minus 10 of the dark matter mass energy through decays. So if you've got some subcomponent of the dark matter that is completely decaying away, it has to be less than 10 to the minus 10 of the total dark matter abundance by mass. So there could not be any metastable species that lived to the time of the CMB that had an abundance within 10 orders of magnitude of the dark matter that we see today if it decayed standard to observable standard model particles. So, yeah, so if you have your favorite generic dark matter model, the way to apply these is just get the spectra of the electron-positron pairs and photons produced per annihilation, get your average efficiency factor, just by integrating those spectra with respect to these efficiency curves. And then the constraint from Planck can just be summarized like this as a constraint on the efficiency factor times the cross-section divided by the mass, as Neil explained yesterday. It's less than this value. For decay, um, the efficiency values that we showed are not... Um, so for annihilation, Planck assumed a particular normalization when they said these constraints where efficiency values are normalized to get that right. For decay... There's no a priori normalization. So this is the constraint that we set for decay to 30 MeV electrons and positrons. So calibrate your efficiency factor for your model to that efficiency factor, and then you set a limit, and then you can set the limit on the lifetime for your model. So it's very simple. All you need to do is download these sets of F effective numbers, and then you can apply this to any dark matter model of your choosing. OK. So what I want to talk about now is, OK, so that's my overview of where we stand with constraints on indirect detection at the moment. If you're thinking about a dark matter model, these are the constraints that you should think about. So now I want to say a bit about the hints of signals that we have. So the first is the positron excess that we looked at earlier. So this is an up-to-date measurement of the electron and positron spectra from AMSO2. Red line is positrons. 
blue line is electrons. So you see that, as we said, the, the positive, so um, this is E cubed times the positron flux. So this is rising faster than the electron spectrum, up above about 10 GeV. And then it, and in the la last few data points they have, it's starting to fall off. So this sh could signal some scale in the problem. If this was coming from dark matter annihilation, this would give us information as to the dark matter mass. This is a plot of older fits of dark matter models to this positron fraction. So just want you to notice a couple of things here. One is that to fit this model with dark matter annihilation, you need fairly heavy mass scales. Um, and you need pretty high cross sections. So these cross sections are all around 10 to the minus 23, 10 to the minus 24 centimeters cubed per second. Furthermore, because we don't see a bump as large as this in the antiproton channel, you need your dark matter model to not predict a lot of antiprotons. That can be done, for example, in dark photon models, but it's another constraint. So you want your annihilation decay to be mostly the leptonic channels, and if you're talking about annihilation, the cross section needs to be pretty large. As we just saw, the required parameters for annihilation or intention are apparently excluded by several other searches. The same is actually now true for decay. If you go back to those heavy dark matter decay constraints that we looked at earlier, the decay rate that you need to get this signal is also pretty hard to reconcile with those other limits. But, uh, you know, give creative theorists a target and they will probably be able to find a way around it. So how might, so the other possibility if this isn't dark matter is that this is some new astrophysical source of positrons. And the leading explanation for this for a long time has been, well, maybe some nearby pulsars. So pulsars are spinning neutron stars. They have very high magnetic fields. They have a pair production cascade going on in their magnetospheres. So they can produce both high energy photons and high energy positrons and electrons. The problem is that we don't really know what the spectrum of positrons and electrons is produced by a pulsar. So how might you test this hypothesis versus the dark matter hypothesis? Well, one thing is that you could look for that anisotropy in the cosmic ray arrival directions. So this plot shows the fractional anisotropy expected if 100% of the signal came from these two nearby pulsars, Gaminga or Monogen. And you can see this is 1%, this is 0.1%. Because the magnetic fields scramble the, cos the cosmic ray arrival directions, these predicted anisotropies are pretty small. And these points up here show current constraints on the anisotropies from Fermi. Uh, the constraints from AMS are unfortunately um, e even somewhat weaker. But it was pointed out in this paper by Linden and Profumo in 2013 that the, the ground-based air Cherenkov tel yeah, so this blue line is the AMS constraint. So we're a long way away from being able to measure this anisotropy with the cosmic ray experiments. But it was pointed out by Linden and Profumo that the ground-based uh, detectors like HESS and in future CTA are also cosmic ray detectors. This is actually their major background. They, it's hard to tell a photon hitting the atmosphere and making a Cherenkov shower from a cosmic ray hitting the atmosphere and making a Cherenkov shower. So they can search for these anisotropies as well. And because they're ground-based, they can have huge effective areas compared to Fermi or AMS. You know, they have 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5 square meters instead of 1 square meter. So with observations like just of their cosmic ray backgrounds, HESS and CTA might be able to start probing the level of anisotropies, at least associated with one being nearby pulsar making the excess. So that's one possibility. That's one. The other possibility, the other new piece of evidence, which just came out earlier this year and which I think is pretty cool, Hawk has been looking at pulsars and has detected extended gamma ray emission around two nearby pulsars, one of which is Gaminga. So, an obvious explanation for this is that this halo of high energy emission around the pulsars is coming from the electrons and positrons produced by the pulsar getting out of the pulsar and upscattering the ambient photons up to gamma ray energies. But if that's true, that means that we now have a direct measurement of the electron and positron spectra produced by these pulsars for the first time. So there's some debate about, so I mean, this is still very much an open question. The first results on this were just a few months ago. This is still pretty fast moving, but there's at least one paper by Hooper and Linden arguing that these measurements suggest that pulsars should provide a dominant contribution to the AMS O2 positrons. This is just one of their example models. Their paper, I have not at least seen so far a paper that tried to do sort of a detailed scan of what would work and what wouldn't and how much of the parameter space. It's true that these, this can explain the whole signal. But, um, but this is one of the example models in their, in their paper that is consistent with these gamma ray halos. 
So this, I think, is the new is the most exciting new development in maybe being able to tell where the Pamela positrons are coming from. There's another AMS02 cosmic ray excess as well. There's a claimed, so there are these two papers earlier this year that looked at the AMS02 antiproton data and claimed that there is a little bump around about 20 GeV proton energy. It's a pretty small bump. This plot on the right is showing the residuals before you put in a dark matter model. So it's just this little excess here. But the nominal statistical significance of this signal is about four sigma. And this shows their constraint on antiproton on the cross section for dark matter annihilating. I think this is to B quarks. And this red region is where they think they see a signal. Now, this is right around the Thomorella cross section. And it's consistent with those blobs I showed you earlier for the GVXS, which I'll talk about a bit more in a second. The things you should be cautious about here are one, um, AMS has not released um, covariance matrices for how these various, um, like they have not released covariance matrices for the error bars here. So these experimenters are both assuming that the error bars are perfectly uncorrelated. But this does give them a chi-squared per degree of freedom, which is much, much less than one. So like the fit looks way too good. So that suggests that there might be some correlations between the error bars that they are missing. Um, if that's the case, it could potentially change the significance. The other issue is just that we don't actually have a really good measurement of the, anti of the antiproton production cross-section under these circumstances. And also, you need to model cosmic ray propagation and solar modulation. So now you can say, well, but most cosmic ray propagation effects or the effects of our sun shouldn't sculpt a bump in the antiproton spectrum. I'll just finish this. Um, but it, I've talked to people who've tried doing this. And if you model the production cross-section wrong, then you can, then you can sculpt features in the spectrum. Yeah? Is this, is this uh, to be bar? Um, was yep. the yeah, th those were yeah, those ones were to be bar. I'll show you the G. I mean, uh, it is people use BB bar as a convenient channel, but in general, all of these they're just probing you make quarks. <laughs> you make things that can hadronize and make protons and antiprotons and neutral pions, and the pions produce gamma rays. So I mean, everyone shows BB bar for the galactic center excess, but if you went to you, but if you went to light quarks instead it really wouldn't make much difference. For the galactic center excess, also if you go to an on-shell Higgs, that then, then decays, if you go to a Higgs that is just above threshold, that then decays mostly into BB bar, and it looks just like BB bar. Okay, so I mean, this is interesting and something to keep an eye on, um, but it hasn't gotten, it hasn't spurred a huge um, amount of theoretical activity, partly because of these caveats. And this, I honestly don't know how you test whether it's dark matter or some mismodeling in the potential, besides seeing a corresponding dark matter signal somewhere else. If anyone has good ideas for that, uh, let me know and or write a paper. OK. So and the, uh, another anomaly that has gotten a lot of attention is in the, is in the x-rays. We see th there's an apparent detection in a number of regions of sort of a 2 to 4 sigma significance detection of a spectral line at about 3 point kV in the x-rays. So this is from the original discovery paper, one of the original discovery papers in 2014. So this is, these are the residuals between the model and the background. These red points are before you put in a model for the line. Uh, the blue points are after you put in a model for the line. There have been a lot of follow-up observational studies. This excess was originally seen in a stacked sample of clusters. Um, it's since been is since being claimed in the Milky Way Galactic Center and in the Draco Dwarf. It has not been seen in the Milky Way Dwarf galaxies or in the outer regions of galaxies and searches have been done. It's also been seen with two telescopes. Most of the observations are from XMM-Newton, but there have been some detections with Chandra and Suzaku data as well. So it doesn't look like it's an experimental systematic. There's a very good review on this by Abazagian from earlier this year. I would recommend looking at that if you're, if you're interested in it. This is in the context of an interpretation for this signal where it comes from the decay of a sterile neutrino, the mixing angle, the favored regions of mixing angle versus dark matter mass. So the picture here would be a 7 keV sterile neutrino that's decaying into a photon and a neutrino, and the photon picks up half its energy. So these regions here are the various detections. These blue and pink circles are the original detections from 2014. Um, this purple region is a recent analysis done earlier this year of, with the Chandra telescope of 
regions out in the halo of the Milky Way. Um, this was a measurement just of the Perseus cluster. These other sort of polyps here are um, uh, measurements of other clusters individually. And then these lines are apparent constraints from various regions. So like this green line is the constraint set by non-observation of dwarf galaxies, and the blue line is a constraint set by non-observation of a signal from the Andromeda galaxy. So, and so there's also, and this is the constraint from the Hitomi telescope, which was going to be the conclusive test of this signal, but unfortunately <coughs> broke up after only a short time in orbit. So you might say, okay, well, this seems to be my favorite region, and it seems to be ruled out by the dwarf dot detection and by M31. But as always, there's some argument that you should be able to shift those curves by a little bit. I encourage you to look at this review for more details. So if this is dark matter, the simplest dark matter explanation is a decaying sterile neutrino dark matter. Um, it's a bit, this is all within the sterile neutrino interpretation. This model, this uh, scenario was extremely predictive because um, it just says, well, the signal from any region should just be directly proportional to the amount of dark matter mass in that region, which is exactly what we can measure gravitationally, and its intention with some of the observations. So this tension has led some people to think about more complicated dark matter models. Um, the more complicated dark matter models all basically work by making the model less predictive so that you can get away from these constraints. It's fair enough. I mean, this, this might be the answer, but like, keep in mind this is what's going on. People are adding more free parameters to the model so you can get away from the constraints. So you could have, for example, a situation where, the dark, where what you're seeing is not the dark matter itself decaying, but the dark matter is heavier, but there's a small mass scale in the problem that comes from a gap between a dark matter ground state and an excited state. These two particles collide together, then the excited state decays back down and makes a 3.5 kV line. The advantage of this, from the perspective of evading constraints, is that so now this signal depends on the density squared, and it also has a velocity dependence, because you need enough velocity to excite the excited state in the first place. So that can kill your signal in dwarfs, where the velocities are very low and is much less constrained than just the total amount of dark matter in objects. People have also talked about a decay making um, axion-like particles that, that then oscillate into a light dark photon, but to see the photon, you need to have a magnetic field present to allow this oscillation. So in that case, you will expect to see big signals in systems with high magnetic fields and low signals in systems with low magnetic fields like dwarfs. So th those are just a couple of examples of what you might do. Now, of course, the other possibility is that this may not be a dark matter signal at all. Um, so there's an ongoing controversy over possible contamination from uh, atomic lines, because while in the gamma rays, a line signal is very clean, in the X-rays, you can have atomic lines at this level as well. There are these complicated charge exchange reactions between sulfur nuclei. A sulfur nucleus comes in, it can steal electrons from hydrogen and then undergo this cascade of decays down to the ground state, which can also produce emission around 3.5 kV. Now, the hope was that the Hitomi experiment would resolve this issue, but it broke up in orbit. And as you saw from the Hitomi constraint on the previous plot, it doesn't really rule out the most favored region. So one possibility in the next few years may be that the micro X sounding rocket could provide a test of this signal. So what you do here is you put a very accurate spectrometer on a rocket, and you shoot it up, and then it comes back down. It doesn't stay up in orbit, so it's, it's cheap. You don't actually have to get it to orbit. The downside is that you only have five minutes with the spectrometer looking at the sky. But the spectrometer is reusable. You can retrieve it, put it on another rocket, and do this again if you see anything in your first year. This spectrometer has no pointing information. It's basically just collecting photons. Um, so you can't tell where the signal came from. But it's got a pretty large field of view. It can look at a large chunk of the sky at any given time. And this is the key point. They think they can build this thing with absolutely amazing energy resolution. So energy resolution of about 3 eV at 3.5 keV. So if you can do this, you can do two things with excellent energy resolution. One is you can say, oh, look, this line is or is not at the same energy as the known potassium and chlorine lines. You can resolve the, the um, structure of lines from the sulfur charge exchange. So this would allow you to test, if you do see a line, this would allow you to test a lot of the astrophysical explanation. But the other thing that you can do, this is cool, is if this was coming from a dark matter signal, the dark matter in our halo, we are, our, gal our galaxy is rotating relative to its dark matter halo. So there is, so both the dark matter has a specific velocity dispersion, which we think we know, and dark matter in different directions from us is moving at different velocities relative to us. That means that there is both a Doppler broadening of the line and a Doppler shift of the line, depending on which, which, and that Doppler shift depends on which direction we look in. 
in the halo. With 3 EV energy resolution, you can start probing this. So this would actually be a smoking gun for dark matter annihilation, or at least a source that is not co-rotating with our galactic halo, if you could see it. This is a paper by uh, Laha et al., which goes into this in detail. So Tali Figueroa gave me an example of a micro X mock observation where they, in, in their example, this, if the lion is present and at the significance expected by Buyaski et al., then this is kind of what they'd expect to see with their one five minute exposure. And if they did see something there, uh, then it would be very easy to do another run. So their dark matter search run is planned for 2019. So keep an eye on that. I think that is the best uh, near-term prospect for resolving the 3.5 kV line. Okay, last thing that I want to talk about, and I may deprive you from coffee for a, for a little bit longer, is the galactic center excess. So we talked earlier about um, so we talked earlier about searching for continuum gamma ray signals, and I've said all oh, the backgrounds in the galactic center are pretty large. So let me show you what that means. So a weak scale, if we want to look in the galactic center, is potentially a good place to do dark matter searches, but a weak scale energies, any expected dark matter signal that we wouldn't have seen immediately will be pretty <laughs> subdominant to the backgrounds. So those backgrounds, they come from cosmic ray protons interacting with the gas and producing neutral pions, which decay into photons, cosmic ray electrons, upscattering starlight photons to gamma ray energies. And you could also have just compact sources producing gamma rays. I talked about pulsars. They make high energy electrons and positrons. They can also make high energy gamma ray photons. Now, it is general. Now, so the only thing that gives us hope for the galactic center is that we know roughly where the gas is in the galaxy. All of these backgrounds should trace the gas, the starlight, the star formation, the supernovae. They should trace the disk of the Milky Way. That's it. We know this is a general statement. The 3D distribution of gas, starlight, magnetic fields, and so on is not very well measured. But nonetheless, this is a map of the gas of the Milky Way, a two-dimensional map projected along the line of sight. This line here is the galactic plane. So um, if you were to see a signal that instead of being shaped like this disk was shaped like something much more extended and distinctly non-disk-like, then that might give you hope that this could be a dark matter signal. Okay, so if we want to look for a dark matter signal, we have to try to model this background. So you can build a model for this background incorporating maps of the gas and models for the cosmic ray and radiation distributions. Now, remember from last time when we model the cosmic ray distribution, we're making the assumption that the galaxy is a cylindrical cow. Okay, so that you, you're going to see errors in this model. Some of those errors are just coming from totally well understood stuff like the galaxy has spiral arms. Our cosmic ray model is not taking into account the existence of spiral arms. And there is work to do, so there is work currently ongoing and work to be done to just get better inputs to this model. Okay? But this is what happens if you just try to build a model for the diffuse emission incorporating maps of the gas and models and current models for the cosmic ray and radiation distributions. I'm going to show you results using public models made available by the Fermi collaboration. Now, these the methods that I'm going to show you have also been used in other contexts as well. Okay, so this is what the Fermi this is what a map of the gamma ray sky from Fermi looks like. I think this is in the two to five GeV energy range. Black is brighter here. So this region along here, this is the galactic plane looked on the previous map. If we, this is what our model, this is what a simple model looks like just using the maps of the gas that we already have, models for the cosmic ray and radiation distributions. You can see that, you know, they, they look pretty similar. We understand where most of the cosmic rays in the galaxy are coming from, they just trace the gas. So if we subtract one from the other, we get residuals that look like this. Two things I want you to notice here. One is that there are residuals. All, so all along the galactic plane here, these white regions are regions of oversubtraction where the model is too bright relative to, relative to the gas. There's more oversubtraction on one side than the other. That difference is probably associated with the spiral arms of the Milky Way. Because of the level of the background modeling here, it is not true that any time you see a four sigma excess or something, you should be really excited, okay? Like there are, there are tons of four and five sigma excesses or deficits all over this map. So when should you be excited? Well, you should maybe be excited if your, if your excess has properties that are different from every other excess on the sky. In this, we can see a structure shaped like this. These are called the Fermi bubbles. My collaborators and I found this in 2010 when we basically just did exactly this exercise that I've just showed you. So 
this is a structure, you know, it's, it's large scale, it's coherent. If you look at the edges of these bubbles, it's actually a pretty sharp, it's, it's a pretty sharp change. That would be hard to fake by just getting the gas maps wrong. Like if, you, if you see that from inside the bubbles to outside the bubbles, you have a profile that looks like this, that kind of sharp structure is pretty hard to get wrong by mismodeling something that is really like this as like this. So the bubbles were discovered in 2010. But if we want to look into the galactic center, we want to look into this region down here. OK. So what methods can we use? Well, so, so I might look at this map and just say, OK, I see, I see these residuals. I see these bubbles. If I want to study, say, the spectrum of these bubbles, then something I can do is redo the fit but putting in an explicit template for these bubbles. So I'm going to model the sky as a linear combination of that background model that I just showed and something that looks like these bubbles. And I'm going to do this independently in each energy bin and ask, you know, how, how, what is the significance of this new template in each energy bin, how much emission is associated with it. And that gives me a spectrum. So this is an example of a fit like this, where in addition, so where I've used the diffuse model and the Fermi bubbles, and additionally, I have put in a signal that looks like what you would expect from a dark matter annihilation signal if our galaxy has a cuspy profile, like an NFW profile. And this is what you get, it, although this plot is slightly wrong. This is an old plot. So you don't take the details of the plot separately. Uh, don't take the details of this plot too seriously. But it shows you what the basics. So now this is the reconstructed flux in each energy bin associated with each of these templates. We're also going to add in just an isotropic template to pick up isotropic extragalactic gamma ray emission. So then this red line shows the reconstructed spectrum associated with this gas map. And above about a GeV, this is pretty much just like a power law. And this is the power law that you would expect from cosmic ray protons interacting with the gas. Below a GeV, it has non-power law-like behavior. That's expected because the proton mass scale and the pion mass scale start to matter below a GeV. So there's, there's a, that's a real feature. If we look at the Fermi bubbles, the spectrum associated with these bubbles is this blue line. So you know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty flat. And if we look at the spectrum associated with this, um, I'm going to call it the NFW template, but it's really like an NFW squared template projected along the line of sight, as we talked about with the J factors earlier, then we see that there's also a spectrum associated with this template. And it's quite significantly detected, like these error bars are a long way away from zero. Um, and it has this sort of bump-like structure which peaks between about 1 and 2 GeV, and then it falls off slowly at low energies and sharply at high energies. So this was not the first time people had seen this GeV excess, but this is a demonstration of what we call the GeV galactic center excess. So summary of the GeV galactic center excess is good enough in Hooper shown in 2009 that there appears to be evidence for a new spectral component in the galactic center. Um, the spectrum of this component looks like a bump at a couple of GeV. This is from a paper that we wrote back in 2014. Uh, these are statistical errors only. This is important. But this black line is a fit to this data using dark matter annihilating the B quarks. It's about a 40 GeV dark matter annihilating the B quarks. Gives a pretty good fit. This plot is a much more careful derivation of the spectrum by Calora et al, where they tried to also do a good estimate of systematic errors. Um, and so this, the black points are statistical errors, yellow bands and blue bands are, are an estimate of the systematic uncertainties. Now, I just told you, well, okay, but you shouldn't take seriously any excess that is four, four sigma or 10 sigma or 20 sigma. This is actually about a 30 sigma excess if you only include the statistical errors, which you should be cautious about. So why should I take this excess seriously as a possible signal? This is one of the reasons. So we didn't just put in that NFW template by chance. You can test changing the slope of that template. And you generally find that, and you can try different profiles, like a Gaussian profile, rather than this template that rises steeply towards the galactic center. And you find that the NFW squared template actually does a very good job of fitting the data. Um, better than any of the other simple models I've tried. You can also look at where this signal is bright. So um, if you look at, so Calora et al. did this analysis where they broke the region around the galactic center into these different quadrants. And then they looked at the spectrum independently in each of these quadrants. And you can see that in pretty much all of these regions, until you get out to about 20 degrees from the galactic center, you see this bump. 
It's a consistent energy in each of these regions, and it really seems like the size of the bump only depends on how far you are from the galactic center. It falls off at about the same rate along the disk and away from the disk. And it seems to have good precision to be centered on the galactic center. So this doesn't look like something associated with the disk of the galaxy. This is not just, oh, I got my modeling of the gas in the disk a little bit wrong. It would be very surprising if I had a highly non-spherical data and a highly non-spherical model and I subtracted one from the other and I got something that looked like this. So that's why, and yeah, the Fermi collaboration did it, separate analysis. That's why you should take this seriously as a signal which is not just, oh, I messed up my gas map a little bit. Okay? And I think it's generally pretty well agreed in the field now that there's something there and you probably can't absorb it just by messing up the gas map. So, yeah. So, so, so I'm just going to go quickly through this. If it is dark matter, it points you to a mass scale below about 100 GeV. Um, there are a range of channels that can provide a good fit, but they have to be hadronic because you want to make this photon rich continuum. Um, so I can say more about the model building challenges if you're interested in them, but suffice it to say, there are complete models that explain this signal, um, you, you do, you, but you do have to do a little bit of work, um, which are consistent with direct detection and LHC constraints. So if it's not dark matter, well, the other leading hypothesis is that this could be from spinning neutron stars from pulsars, which are known to emit gamma rays with a similar spectrum. Now, nobody expected beforehand that the pulsars would be distributed like this around the galactic center. That doesn't mean it's impossible. People have also talked about cosmic rays hitting the gas, but it's just hard to explain simultaneously the spectrum and the morphology with those results. Again, there are references here. I'll post this online. You can take a look if you're interested. But the key development in the last couple of years has been to say, OK, let's look back a bit more closely at the data. Let's look at the photon statistics of the data and say, well, if this was dark matter, there's dark matter along every line of sight to the galactic center. We expect the signal to look smooth. If this is coming from some population of pulsars or other gamma ray point sources, there should be lines of sight along which there is no signal. So we'd expect the signal to look much more clumpy. So. In this case, so basically the idea here, we can quantify this using statistics. Basically the idea is that if you have a population of diffuse sources, your statistics are very non-Poissonian because once you see a photon from a given region, it tells you that there's a point source there. And so your probability of set, finding a second photon from that region is, no, is not independent of the first. It's much higher. Poisson statistics only apply to independent probabilities. So just a quick example, suppose I tell you that in some region of the sky I expect 10 photons per pixel and I want to know what's my probability of finding 0 photons or 12 photons or 100 photons. Well, if I can use Poisson statistics, the probability of finding 12 photons is pretty high, the probability of finding 0 photons is pretty small, and you will never see 100 photons. But if I know that I've got some population of rare sources there, which produce on average 100 photons each, but there's only one source in every 10 pixels, then now my probability of seeing 0 photons is pretty high, my probability of seeing 12 photons is 0. <laughs> because I would have to have a source there, but then have it fluctuate down from 100 photons to 12. And my probability of seeing 100 photons is pretty reasonable. So if these are my two models, and I see 100 photons in some pixel, I can say, OK, probably case two. So what we do then is we redo this template fitting approach. We model the sky as a linear combination of the diffuse model and the Fermi bubbles and a dark matter signal and isotropic emission. But we also put in templates for distributions of point sources which are similar to these templates, except that they have different statistics. And what we find when we do this analysis is that there's actually a pretty strong preference for this entire GV excess to be absorbed by the point source template. So this plot shows what happens in the fit where you, um, where you don't have any point sources distributed like the galactic center excess. This red line is the dark matter template, the, NF the smooth NFW-like template. Uh, and it picks up about 7 or 8% of the emission in the region that we looked at for this fit, which is consistent with previous analyses. But when we instead put in the template that does correspond to point sources distributed like the excess, it picks up 7 to 8% of the emission. And this red line shows the posterior probability distribution for how much flux is associated with the dark matter template. And you can see that it peaks at zero and has very little support above about 1% of the emission. Um, so we can say, so you can say more about details of the point sources, which I'm going to skip over. If these really are pulsars, there's prospects for finding them in the next few years with radio surveys, because pulsars often emit in the radio and X-ray, as well as in the gamma rays. So that would be a hope for cross-check on that. 
So at present, my feeling about the GVXS is that we have probably discovered a new pulsar population. We should have a strong test of that in the next couple of years with radio experiments. If you want to play with these results, with both the point source sphere and with looking at the GVXS generally, um, everything I've showed you and some of the things I didn't are now available as a fully public code package at this address, and they're documented in this paper. The Fermi data is all completely public. Anyone can download it. Anyone can play with it. Um, and as you've seen, there's some interesting stuff to find in there. Okay, so that's where we currently stand with respect to the dark matter anomalies. Sorry for taking up some of your coffee break, but I, I wanted to show you this stuff. Thank you for all your questions, and yeah, thank you for listening.